Hi, Jennifer here. Today I want to talk about The Last Jedi. I'm a humanist. I normally review Bollywood movies or Indian movies and we talk about uh, the moral content of those movies and how we feel about them and what it talks to us as humans about what it means to be a good human. Today we're going to talk about The Last Jedi. Yes, I saw it this weekend. Just to warn you before we get into this, this will contain spoilers. Um, I don't think I'm going to do very many like really deep spoilers, but there are some major spoilers that are important to the conversation about the morality, so they will be included in this. If you don't want the movie spoiled, wait until after you see the movie to view this video. First impressions, really, really liked it. Uh, we saw it this weekend with my son. We weren't sure if he could handle it because he was really upset by The Force Awakens because uh, Kylo Ren kill, obviously <laughs> kills Han Solo and he just, he went ballistic and he can't even watch The Force Awakens. It upsets him so much. But this one, he loved the whole thing and he had no problem with Kylo Ren's role in it. Um, he actually thought it was a really nice it was nice to see Kylo Ren developing. Um, now that I'm looking at the poster for this movie, it makes sense because the, the last stand of the resistance against the New Order takes place on a crystal planet, actually a salt, a salt mine planet, uh, and the, the crust is white, but underneath is red crystal, and that's where the, the final battle takes place in, in, this, in this movie. Let's start with some of the technical technical stuff before we get into the plot and into uh, the humanist discussion on it. As I said, the uh, the final battle sequence takes place on this on the salt planet, a salt mine, and the, the surface crust is white and the crystal underneath is red, and it makes for these gorgeous displays because it looks like blood, but it's not blood. And when you first see this. You think is this guy bleeding but it turns out it's salt and they use it to good effect on the battlefield for these the final battle that's taking place where the re the resistance is pretty much being decimated and it just looks like a bloodbath it's not a bloodbath it's salt but it looks like a bloodbath um, and it, it's really cool. And I thought, you know, the special effects and the choice of, of design, the way this thing looked, it was absolutely gorgeous. Everything you want in a Star Wars movie. Um, in the left, left, I don't know how to do that. In the left corner, you see the throne room for Emperor Snokes, who's basically the Palpatine in this movie, um, in the first couple of movies. And he has turned... Uh, ben into Kylo Ren and made him a Sith and we have a scene there's uh, what I liked about this movie is there's the echo you know uh, seasons uh, episodes four five and six so in episode six when Luke confronts Palpatine in hoping hoping to turn Vader to the light again by using his familial relationship with them to get Vader to come back to being Anakin. Um, that's echoed really well in this set. It's a very minimalist set. You can see that it's got all this red, Sith red, but it, there's elements in the set, in the control room aspects of this, this set that really like evoke the set in episodes, the throne room in episode six. And it doesn't turn out the same way. <laughs> I mean, it, it kind of does. Ren, Kylo Ren turns on the Emperor, spoiler. Um, but then he wants to rule the galaxy with Rey and Rey's having none of it, you know? And that goes back to episode five where, you know, Vader says, Luke, I am your father and we come with me and we'll overthrow the dictator and we'll rule this galaxy and bring peace to the galaxy. And Kylo Ren makes the same pitch to Rey, and she does the same thing Luke did, which is to reject the offer. And the other nice thing was the ships. The space battle sequences were great. Uh, below me, you'll see these are the bombers. Uh, the bombers go on a raid on this. What my my son knows better about these ships than me. He was going, "Oh my gosh, that's a." Da -da 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 -da. 
<laughs> but they, they were these ships are massive, and if you remember when they came out with the Super Star Destroyer that was so much bigger than the Star Destroyer, which was also already massive. It's even massiver than that, and these these ba these bombers have to uh, go. Well, they don't have to. They go on a run to destroy this mega ship. Uh, they only destroy one of them, and there's others, so it was pointless. And all the bombers are lost. And we're going to talk about how stupid that was from a pl not a plot point because it, it it needed to happen in the plot. But the dis who made that decision to do that and why they were wrong to make that decision is going to play out in some of the conversations about the humanism and the morality and, and stuff like that. Because it has to do with the male-female dynamic that's at play in this movie. And it's really, really well done. Um, although I did not like how, st how stupid the men were. <laughs> And I thought that was unfair because the men I know are not stupid like this. But the men in this movie are stupid. All of them are stupid. They're just stupid. None of this would be happening if the men weren't in charge. <laughs> Which is part of what we're going to talk about. And I think it's unfair to men, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, but moving on. Uh, one of the things we like about Star Wars is the creatures. And they, we have several new ones. The ones above us are kind of... I would say they're cl more closely to the Ewoks, but they're the creatures that are, they're sentient and they live on a planet that contains the first Jedi temple where Luke Skywalker has been hanging out waiting to die. And they are great. <laughs> they are great. <laughs> Ray shows up and is trying to get Luke to like join the resistance again and he doesn't want to have anything to do it because he thinks the Jedi should be wiped out. The Jedi teachings are all completely wrong and there's just no point to it and he wants the Jedi order to end with him, right? And she shows up and she's trying to convince him but at the same time she's coming into her own powers and she didn't know how to control them. And so she keeps blasting holes in buildings <laughs> boulders you know falling off and destroying a cart and these poor creatures are like seriously <laughs> like what the heck are you doing stop making messes for us to clean up i love these guys i love this these characters um they were great there we go there we go uh the animal with the big floppy ears it's kind of a llama panther horse racing this this occurs on there we go there we go it's so hard i can't uh, anyways that one no nope, that one uh, whatever okay so i can't do it um but it's the one that that's in the stall um i don't know what they're called but there's they're racing on um they're abused animals that are being raced for uh gambling on a casino planet they're great. They are fabulous. They are the most amazing creatures ever. Uh, they're kind. Their caretakers are little kids who are enslaved. And um, one of which has Jedi powers or a force. Let's not call them Jedi powers anymore because that's after this movie not appropriate to talk about those powers as Jedi powers. They're force wielding powers. And I'm going to get into why <laughs> that's the case in a little bit. But those animals are really great. Uh, we really, really enjoyed that whole sequence when they burst into the casino and destroy things. It's it's fabulous. There's also that um, crystal cat, the salt cat from the, the salt planet. Gorgeous. I love their whole sequence and how the, the re rebellion, the resistance is kind of dealing with that. And then you have the porks. <laughs> now, I was really, really... I was really excited about the porgs, right? I got I got myself a porg Star Wars tin at the movie theater. I was very excited because porgs. I was expecting more from the porgs. I was thinking the porgs would be kind of like um, the Ewoks, right? A sentient creature that um, was just 
small, right? But could do a lot of stuff. And that was the great thing about the Ewoks is they were small, small, cute teddy bears, but they were sentient and clever and wonderful. And the Porgs are basically a bird. They're really funny. They provide a lot of comic relief. And Chewbacca uh, lets them come into the Millennium Falcon. We don't know at the end of this movie how many Porgs are on the Millennial, Fa Millennium, Millennial Falcon. Uh, but they pick them up on the the Jedi Temple planet, and where Luke is, and you know uh, Chewbacca is gonna eat them, and then realizes how cute they are, and they're all devastated that he's trying to eat one of their their friends. But they're in all the Millennial this this one's in all the Millennial Falcon scenes. But he he's basically a pet, and that's disappointing. I was hoping for more from them. Let's talk about some of the special characters that are in this movie. Um, over here we have the people that are in the casino. And they're actually kind of important. They, we, ju we just pass them um, as Finn and Rose, who's on the far end there, uh, are on the casino planet looking for a thief to help them break in to a... Uh, new order ship so that they can do something to its tracking device so that the rebellion, the resistance can escape because they're in the process of uh, being annihilated by the new order. And when I say annihilated, they're all going to die. And so this is a plan to try and help them escape. And they're going to need a thief to get them in. And the thief is on the casino planet. All right. Um, and we're going to talk more about these people here on the casino planet because it does play into uh, the moral conversations that we need to have as a result of this movie. Now on the far end, far far end is Rose. She is um, she's working on one of the resistant ships. Her sister dies a very noble death in the uh, the battle with the the bomber, she, her sister's a bombardier and sacrifices herself to destroy this major ship that Poe needed them to destroy, despite Leia's orders to retreat. Um, she's great. She goes with Finn. She comes up with the idea of how to help the fleet escape. She teams up with Flynn to do that. We're going to have a conversation about Finn and Rose's relationship because there is some mansplaining going on in there and it was really well filmed and we need to talk about how the men in Star Wars are not treating their female counterparts with respect at all. And that and all the mistakes that are made that lead to all the problems that almost decimate the resistant have to do with men not respecting their female counterparts. Benicio de Toro plays, he's great. <laughs> he plays a thief and he helps um, Rose and Finn get onto the ship, but he also sells them out. And he's got some really great comments at the end where he talks about, well, yeah, today they're blowing you up and tomorrow you'll blow them up. It's all the same to me, which is great. Now in the corner, okay, hold on. No, I can't do that. In the corner, you'll see Laura Dern uh, she plays a, a commander, a, a resistance commander. She's fabulous in it. Poe disrespects her entirely, though she really likes Poe. He doesn't respect her. And a lot of the problems we have, all of the problems that the resistance have, ha comes from Poe not respecting the women generals. We're going to have a conversation about that. Uh... Also in this movie, we have Luke and Leia, um, and they play central roles, uh, different roles. Luke has decided to be the last Jedi. Uh, and again, this is a spoiler, but he doesn't think that the, the Jedi as a religion should continue because all the teachings lead to suffering. Um, and they don't do a good job of fighting authoritarianism in the form of the new order and the, the Sith religion, the, the religion of the Sith. 
Um, Leia has taken an active engagement and her use of the force is not a Jedi use of the force. She's not a Jedi. She's just a force wielder. And uh, which means she's not a religious, she's, she doesn't view the force in a religious way the way Luke does with the teaching and the dogma and all of that. But we have a great moment in the movie where you think she's going to die. And you think, you think that her son, Ren, uh, Carlo Ren is going to kill her. And he holds off. And again, this is what he holds off and doesn't kill her. But then she's blasted out of the sky anyway. And she ends up in space and she uses the force to get back to safety. And she's, she's literally in space without a space suit and uses the force to get herself back into the blown up ship so that she can get taken care of. And it's a beautiful use of the force. And it has nothing to do with the Jedi religion or the Sith religion. It's just her using the force, not for good or evil, but for self-protection and, and to help people. Um, so we have them coming back and they're going to play into how the story plays out because again, you have a male use of the force and a female use of the force. The male being, um, someone who bought into a religion and has given up on that religion and wants to be the last one with the religion. And he can't quite get himself out of the framework of that religion. We're going to talk about that when we talk about his relationship to Ray. Now the main characters, characters of this movie are obviously Ray, uh, Poe, Finn, Kylo Ren, and Rose. So uh, there, there is some disagreement on who, who the story is really about. Is it about Ray or is it about Kylo Ren or is it about both of them? I asked my husband this because I have a friend, um, Camels Without Hammers, and he did a review of this. And uh, my, fr you know, Camels, Dan's review was all about Kylo Ren and how he, you know, this is his journey. And I, I liked his, his review of it because he talks about the Nietzschean duality and how that's problematic and flawed thinking to begin with. But I was thinking to myself, this movie isn't about Kylo Ren. It's about Ray. We're following Ray. This is Ray's journey. It starts with Ray. It ends with Ray, right? Um, and I asked my husband, who's male, to see if maybe this is a male-female thing. And, when I, and I, I didn't say who I thought it was. I said, who do you think is the lead character? Is it Ray or Ren? And he said, oh, it's clearly Ray. Um, although he, he, did, he could see that there would be a case made for Kylo Ren. So we're going to talk about Ray and Ren in a little bit. The other main characters are uh, Poe, who's the, the pilot, and Finn, who's the former... Um, uh, uh, stormtrooper who just wants to not have anything to do with any of this. And then Rose, who's a uh, support person on one of the resistance ships. And, uh, you know, pretty much all of the problems that the resistance has in this movie are a result of Poe doing stupid things. <laughs> Seriously, like the whole movie hinges on Poe being stupid. Um, Finn also does some incredibly stupid things um, and he's kind of responsible too, but his journey is a little bit better. Now, what I like about Finn is he's kind of following Han Solo's uh, story arc, which is, you know, used to work for the Empire and, and then, you know, went, wants to be in it for himself, doesn't want to, doesn't really care about the resistance, but and doesn't care about the new order, just wants to live his life free of all of that. Um, but he keeps getting drawn back in because he cares about people. He genuinely cares about people. Rose's character, I love Rose. She's responsible for helping Poe understand morality like and his responsibilities towards his morality he has the morality he has the feelings but she helps bring it out to the, the 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 foreground and i think that's really good and again we're going to talk about these storylines in just a little bit for me um the real the real story arc has to do with the yin and yang ray and ren and uh, throughout the movie, we get references to yin yang. Rose, ha Rose and her sister have yin yang symbols on them, um, half and half, the duality of that. And we're told from the beginning of these movies about 
needing to find balance in the force that you know luke is the one who's going to bring balance to the force and anakin's the one who's going to bring balance to the force but they keep every all the characters in all these movies keep retreating to sides right we're gonna be a jedi or we're gonna be a sith and there's no no one in the middle and so i like i like how they're creating this yin yang situation between Rey and Ren, and we're following their stories together and their relationship with each other and in opposition to each other, but also joined together. Um, because I think when, when I think of balance between light and dark, we're not talking about choosing light or choosing dark. We're talking about accepting both of these as inherent in our nature. And as a humanist, you know, I think this is a really, this is how I look at the uh, human. This is how I look at myself. I'm not perfect. I have good tendency, altruistic tendencies, and I have selfish tendencies. I'm not one or the other. I'm both. And actually, when we talk about how to be our best, we're usually talking about enlightened self-interest, where the altruism helps us, helps our self-interest, that we can do both be self-interested and altruistic simultaneously that's balance and we've never had a star wars movie where we've achieved that balance ever because what happens you know when oh he's going to bring balance to the force but then they won't let him explore the dark side like there's this jedi prohibition on anything dark and you're not allowed to explore it you're not allowed to experience it you're supposed to just shut it away and not experience it all it's a completely unrealistic expectation that you know you just shut this side of yourself off forever and we've seen that through every movie i mean that was the problem that was the problem that anakin has is he's not allowed to to have attachments and love because love leads to fear and fear leads to anger and anger leads to hate hate leads to suffering right that's the problem with attachment but if you don't have attachment then what are you fighting for i've never understood this part of it there's one of the books in the yuzhong vong series and i have read several of the star wars books has to do with um with jason who is basically ben in this movie um who has this journey to the dark side and um you know how do you fight with love like that's the central problem the jedis always have is how do you fight with love and um jason says you don't when you have to fight you fight and this is a very um a krishna thing to say if you've ever read the bhagavad gita you'll know that you know uh arjun does not want to fight his family which is what that battle that's happening in bhagavad gita is going to be about um, but he has a responsibility when you're in that situation, your responsibility is just to fight and get it over with. And um, the um, Musashi in Japan, who wrote the Book of the Five Rings, uh, philosopher warrior, and he says the same thing in the moment. If you are fighting and it's an art, your job is to kill people, period. <laughs> you know, and it, it's not an emotional thing. It's not that you hate these people. It's just that is what your job is and you need to do it or you will die so there's a lot going on there's obviously a lot going on with this this theme has been explored in every culture i think and in every time and our time the story that's helping us have these conversations about how to fight for what you believe in in a way that is ethically responsible this is the movie to help us have that conversation i think Let's talk about Ray's journey first. Ray is a force wielder. She doesn't know who her parents are. Uh, she gets kind of swept up into the resistance of the New Order and she's sent out, she's given uh, Luke's, Luke's lightsaber and she goes out to find Luke and to try and convince him to rejoin the resistance because the resistance needs hope. It needs hope. And in the meantime, while she's doing this, the resistance base has been found by the New Order and they're, they have to evacuate and they end up in space and they make a hyper jump, but 
the new order can track them and so they can't escape and they're trying to outrun them but they're running out of fuel and in every ship that loses its fuel is destroyed by the new order and they get down to one ship in the meantime she's she's doing she's trying to convince luke to rejoin the resistance and luke says i'm going to give you three lessons in 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 the force and in the and while she's on this planet she's also communing with uh ren and um they're having their their moments and their conversations together and luke's training seems to be this the jedi teachings are crap <laughs> and you shouldn't follow them and the jedi teachings don't work they've always even at the height of their power the jedi allowed the sith to take control and to wipe them out they were wiped out by the sith because the jedi teachings don't work and they're too myopic to work and um he takes her out to a meditation place and has her kind of experience what the force to explain to her what the force is and how to tap into it and she's already kind of learned that she can do this but this is kind of a learning she kind of wants to be a jedi but it's kind of in this moment that she realizes it has nothing to do with the jedi she he tells her to go reach out and what do you what do you feel and she talks about the different things she feels and the light and stuff but then she finds this dark spot on the island and she goes to explore it in her mind and luke completely freaks out I can't believe you're going to the dark. I can't. You didn't even try to resist the dark. But isn't that what balance is? Like, if you never become comfortable with the dark, how are you supposed to control it? Like, you don't control the dark by pushing it away. This is like grief. Let's let's translate dark into grief because in almost every case in every movie, the dark is grief. Anakin's ver journey to the dark side has to do with grief over the love, his love for Padme. And um, everything he does in the next three episodes has to do with, with his grief, dealing with his grief. And I'm a humanist and, you know, I've lost a child. I have lost family, uh, a parent. I have, you know, I, I'm 51 now. I've, I've lived. I've, that means I've lost. And I don't think any of us should fear our grief right it's part of life it's part of the experience of life and it doesn't have to consume you but if you try to push it away and i write about this in my book the humanist approach to happiness if you try to push it away it you can't you can't get rid of the grief it's always going to be there in some form and if you don't deal with it constructively you will deal with it destructively those are like kind of your two options and the luke freaking out about Ray discovering that there is a dark place on this island this the original Jedi temple was built on a dark place and he freaks out and says don't go there and I don't have anything to do with you you need to leave now because you didn't even bother to try and resist the dark and she's sitting there thinking what the heck seriously you told me to reach out why is this so dangerous and she actually takes a journey down into the dark and she's underwhelmed by it she's like what's I was expecting to find something about myself there and it's there's really nothing there there's nothing to be afraid of there and yet luke is terrified of it absolutely terrified of it and yet a woman goes in there and is like, <laughs> like what's the big deal and this comes back to the books right in the books um we learn through the books especially in the yuzhong vong books that every jedi temple has is built on a place of force power and that force power includes a darkness every jedi temple in the universe in its in this galaxy is built on on a a, a dark hole of, of dark power although they um the jedi religion is to reject the dark and, and do the light <sighs> and so that that's kind of her journey with it now luke wants to be the last jedi because he thinks the jedi order has it all wrong and then when he's teaching ray he makes the exact same mistake that yoda made with anakin and that he made with ren 
and and that is to be so afraid of the dark and the grief that is part of life that he shuts himself off and can't function right and ray is courageous enough to meet that and be underwhelmed by it and go okay it's just dark it's the, there's really not a lot there i've explored it there's nothing there that's that interesting <laughs> which is i think a great a great way to view the negative aspects like we're, we're taught in this universe through all these years that you know the darkness leads to hate and suffering but it doesn't always lead to hate and suffering sometimes you can integrate that part without losing your light and that's what to me balance would be right when i think about balance between the dark and light it's accepting the dark and not letting it infect the light you can have both light and dark you need both light and dark to be whole because without the dark, you can't appreciate the light, right? And so you need both, but you don't have to be afraid of the dark. Why would you be afraid of the dark? Like we teach our kids, don't be afraid of the dark. The dark doesn't mean the light goes away. And this is the argument she's making when she, she confronts Ren. And this is the argument that Luke made when he confronted his father, you know, Darth Vader, is there's still light in him. Of course there's still light in him. He's still a human being. The light never went anywhere. He was just consumed with grief and couldn't say, see himself clear to the light. But the light was always still there if he wanted to tap into it. It's the same for Ren. The light is still there if he wants to tap into it. He's just too afraid to tap into it because the, the grief and the dark has become tied to his personality and he doesn't know how to get clear of that. So that's Ray. Let's talk about Ren. Right, Ren is Han Solo's son, he's Leia's son, and he's obviously, he's really well portrayed and obviously very, very conflicted. Um, he's committed himself to Emperor Snoke's and to this, to this course of action. And one of the reasons he kills his father is to try and get his past behind him so he can be fully present in the moment. Um, and it's not working. <laughs> it's not working. Even when he kills Snoke's, spoiler, uh, it still doesn't work. And he's right about several things, which is that um, we have to put the past between the Sith and the Jedi behind us. And that's part of what he's trying to do is kill the past so that he can be in the present. But he's still... And we don't know because he never really gets to discuss the why you know we don't we still don't know why he took this path we're told what happened between him and luke and it's a very uh, as my friend dan pointed out it's very rashomon we get the same we're told about what happened between him and luke in three different ways we get luke's side of the story we get ren's side of the story and then we get luke's modified version of the story and it comes down to trust. He, he didn't, Luke, he thought Luke was going to try and kill him and that Luke didn't trust him. And so he defended himself and he was betrayed. And, and so he goes and he finds a teacher because he thinks he needs a teacher and he doesn't know how to deal with grief and his emotions. So he tries to shut that stuff off by cutting that part of himself off in a, in a literal way by killing his past, killing the people in his past. He wants his dad dead. He wants Luke dead. He doesn't necessarily want his mom dead. All right. And he doesn't, when he has an opportunity to kill his mom, he does not do it, but he d tries his hardest to kill Luke. And he definitely succeeded last movie in killing his dad in his dad. And he's doing that because he's got pain, he's in grief. That's what the darkness is. It's the pain and the grief that this man is carrying around. And, um, and how he thinks he's going to get free of that grief is by acting out violently and killing the things in his past that caused him that grief. Now, what we know outside of the movie, or we should know, and that humanism teaches us is that that response, while perfectly natural to be angry and fearful, that doesn't actually get us to a good positive future. And so that's what he's clearly struggling with. He didn't want to kill his dad, but he thought he had to in order to clear away the pain. 
that he's in. And it clearly didn't, didn't work. And Luke warns him of that when he's trying to kill Luke is, you know, killing me just means I'm going to be in your head forever. If you kill me, I will be in your head forever. You'll never be free of me. And gosh, such wisdom in that, right? Such wisdom. Um, so, you know, that, that's kind of my take on where we, we are with the duality, um, of, of, of the light and the dark, the light being represented by Ray, whose name is literally a ray of light and, um, and Ren, who's human. Like if you go to Chinese, right? Ray, Ren means human. And I think, I think the problem we all have, right, as, as humanists, is how do we rise above our base instincts to be the virtuous person that we want to be? We, you know, Ray's lost people, right? She, she was abandoned um, and by someone, right? And we learned who that was in this movie. And I we'll, we'll talk about that when we can talk about that. But um, she, she still chooses to be a virtuous person even despite her loss. Now, the other characters like Anakin goes to the dark side because he can't cope with the loss. Obviously, Ren made the same choice. He couldn't cope with his loss, so he went and wallowed in the dark. And I, I do think, um, you know, I like the idea of the yin and yang and the balance, and I keep hoping at some point that they will find a way to reject the duality of Sith versus Jedi and just be force wielders. And Yoda makes an appearance to Luke when Luke's trying to decide whether to destroy the Jedi library on the, <laughs> at the original Jedi temple to just get rid of the teachings entirely. And he can't do it. And Yoda goes, lightning bolt, destroys the place. And Luke's like, what did you do? These were the original documents. And, and Yoda's like, no, you're right. They... they there's nothing that we can teach her that she doesn't already know. And the teachings distort the experience by putting unfair morality on top of the force. The force is naturally both light and dark. And it's how we choose to deal with that that determines whether we take the path of virtue or, or, or not. And you know, that's the same thing we struggle with as all humans struggle with is when bad things happen to us, how do we respond to it? Do we wallow in the darkness or do we choose to rise above despite the darkness? It doesn't make the darkness go away. We haven't denied the darkness. It's still there. And to me, that's balance. It's like every time a Jedi got, freaks out that, oh my God, you touch, you touched the dark side and you didn't recoil. That teaches fear. That in itself is the teaching of fear. And then they wonder why their prized pupil like embrace the fear that leads to hate and hate leads to anger and anger leads to hate and hate leads to suffering. When your religious teachings are teaching fear, you should expect these outcomes, right? That fear leads to anger, anger leads to hate, hate leads to suffering. If you don't teach people how to deal constructively with the dark and you teach them to be afraid of the dark, they will never learn how to constructively deal with those emotions. And that is at the heart of what we do as parents is like as a humanist parent, try to help my son deal with the emotions, good and bad, so that when bad things happen, not if bad things happen, when bad things happen, he has the emotional toolkit to deal with them. That to me is what balance is. Let's talk about the feminism <laughs> in this movie. Um, Yeah. Okay. So this is one of the reasons why I think Ray is the main character and, and Ren is the foil. Um, and it has to do with the fact that in this movie, every bad thing that happens happens because men are being stupid. <laughs> and I don't say that this is one of those realizations. It's kind of like, um, it's kind of like, in Big Bang Theory, when Amy points out that it, Indiana Jones was completely point, did not need to be in the Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark movie because the outcome 
was the same whether he's in that movie or not. I, yeah, I understand Indiana Jones is like the main character of Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Star, but she has a point. Everything Indiana Jones does is pointless. If he hadn't been in that movie, the Germans would have still found the Ark, they still would have opened it, and they still would have all melted. <laughs> right? Indiana Jones didn't change the outcome at all. At all. He had no impact on the outcome of that movie. Everything he did, he failed at. Like, failed miserably. He failed to prevent the Germans from getting the Ark, and he failed to prevent them from opening that Ark, so forth and so on, right? This is kind of like that, right? We have a resistance. They're evacuating their planet because they've been found. And Poe decides he's going to take out, he, his job is, he's clearly a force wielder, I think. Anyways, um, his his job is to go and take out the cannons on the ship that's going to prevent the the you know the, the the new order ship that's going to prevent the resistance from leaving. And he's doing that, and then he realizes, oh, we can blow him up. So he orders the the bomber squadrons in, and they follow him. And Leia's like, no, I'm the general. I order you to retreat. And he says, screw that. They lose almost every fighter pilot and they lose every single bomber and they do not succeed in escaping. I mean, they finally succeed in escaping, but it's a hollow victory. He wins a victory against this ship, but it's a hollow victory and it means he almost loses the war on behalf of the resistance because now the resistance is left with far fewer people and like half of the ships they had which means their ability to fight another day is almost non-existent now. All because Poe refused, thought he knew better than his general. Because he wants to fight. And when I say that Poe and Finn, Poe and Finn on the other side of Rey, Poe and Finn almost single-handedly destroy the resistance in the name of saving the resistance, I am not overstating that at all. I am not overstating that at all. Because the next thing that happens is they're trying to get away and Leia is incapacitated because um, uh, uh, Ren, Ren's battleships kind of destroyed her and she got thrown into space and then she's forced to get back, but she's unconscious. So they give control over to Laura Dern's character, um, who's a general, and she comes up with a plan. And Poe doesn't like the plan because he doesn't understand the plan. And she's not telling him what the plan is because he's been demoted. He's not a colonel or a, he's, a cap, he's not even a captain anymore because he defied Leia's order and nearly destroyed the resistance in the process. And so he's not happy with this and is trying to find a way to subvert the orders of the general who just happens to be female. Now, almost every movie, um, you know, almost all of our movies that involve a male hero involve that male hero defying the establishment to save the world, right? They've got to break the rules in order to save the world. That is the plot line of almost every male superhero, action movie, thriller, whatever, ever, right? I mean, it's a trope. You got the cop, the cop's boss says, I need you to do this by the book. And the cop goes, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And then he totally throws the rule book out um, and, you know, breaks the law and, but manages to get the good guy, the bad guy, sorry. Um, and this happens a lot in Indian movies, right? You, you look at the movie Akela with, with Amitabh Bachchan, and that's exactly what's happening. And so this image of male rebel going against the establishment to do the right thing, because the establishment itself is evil, or, or hampering him, is a standard in most movies ever made. Ever. And in this movie, the establishment happens to be 
portrayed exclusively as female. We have two generals, both female. One is General Leia Organa. And she orders him to withdraw. He refuses. He brings the bombers in, destroys every single bomber. They're left without any bombers. Half of their fleet is destroyed. And they're in a, they could have escaped to fight another day, but they don't. And it's because Poe thought he knew better than his generals and he's demoted accordingly and because he's demoted when the new general comes on he don't like her either because she's pampering him and she doesn't fully understand and there's a great moment where he's arguing with her and she she's very <laughs> she accuses him of mansplaining basically oh that's so cute that you're trying to explain this to me thank you like i didn't know we were being chased by the new order you know like she's in command of a fleet that's currently being chased by the new order and he's like but we're being chased by the new order and she's like thank you for pointing that out to me you were demoted right <laughs> and as a woman i'm thinking yes like thank you someone finally shuts up the mansplainer who just got our fleet decimated you know and that wouldn't have happened if he'd followed orders right and then the next thing that happens is he and finn with rose's help come up with a plan to save the fleet from um from the new order and they're going to do this thing they're not going to go to the general and ask for permission they're just going to do it well guess what happens when they succeed in doing that the new order finds out what the general is planning to do and starts decimating the escape so the plan was the the general's plan was to provide a diversion for the new order so that smaller ships that can't be seen on the radar can escape down to a planet this this salt planet which is completely fortified and they're hoping to do that without the new order noticing they're doing it well finn and poe's plan brings the new order's attention to the plan and then they start firing on these ships so instead of losing like one big ship while saving everybody they lose another half so three quarters of the resistance is decimated by poe's rash decisions three quarters of it because he did not respect the women in charge and so he went off on his own and nearly single-handedly destroyed the resistance alone on in the name of saving it right this is the sort of thing that really pisses me off because this disrespect leads to bad problem solving. And what would you rather do? Would you rather win the battle but lose the war? No, you want to win the war. And so in order to win the war, you have to be strategic. Sometimes that means retreating. Strategic retreat, it's called, for a reason. And it's a valid tactic. And he refuses to do that, and he refuses to respect his generals who happen to be women, and he almost destroys the resistance in the process. And we have similar things with Finn. Uh, there's a moment where Finn is going to try and go down and stare down this can, like literally fly a ship into this cannon, and uh, Rose prevents him from doing it. She robs him of his sacrifice, and she tells him, you know, he goes, well, we have to destroy this. And she goes, you don't understand we don't fight what we hate we don't fight to destroy what we hate we fight to save what we love and that means something and i think when i when i look at this from a feminist and therefore a humanist perspective because there is no difference between feminism and humanism um i because if we don't start taking women seriously we don't start respecting women's intelligence and the way women fight battles um, we're never going to get to this balance between the way men fight and the way women fight. And this this played out in America during our presidential election. People were watching the debates between Trump and, and Hillary, and they couldn't see, a lot of people could not see what Hillary was doing as fighting because it looked so completely different. The way a woman leads, the way a woman um, makes decisions, the way a woman fights, is, it looks very different from the way men do it oftentimes and until we start respecting those differences and start allowing women in power and respecting women in power to lead 
We're going to keep having these problems. Um, so, you know, in that sense, I really, I really like this portrayal of the women generals and their strategizing and how they were thinking about, about things. You know, the men, Poe literally could not see the strategic advantage to what Leia and the other general were suggesting. He couldn't see it. He couldn't understand it. He refused to see it because it wasn't what he wanted. And so he, he just didn't respect them enough. And he was trying to mansplain and get shut down. This happens too with when Poe and Finn and Rose are together and Poe is trying to, is trying to understand what Finn and Rose are suggesting they do. And Finn literally walks directly, he, you know, Rose is trying to explain something and Finn directly walks in front of her and starts talking over and explaining what she was about to explain. She's the one who's the expert in it. And she literally does one of, the, one of these, like, can I see you or can I see Poe around you? Because it was like really obnoxious what po, Finn did. And this is part of the problem. Not listening to women is part of the problem that we have when we are problem solving. And this happens in boardrooms, it happens in committees, it happens in marriages, it happens everywhere when men don't listen to the women in their lives. And they actually step in front of us and talk to each other instead of having a three-way conversation. Um, and I thought they portrayed that really well in this movie, um, so much so that I was like, thank you women for working around this and why is this still friggin present in this universe and this comes back to kind of i don't you know my boy and my husband really really like this movie and they might not have understood you know i think what happens is men are so used to seeing portrayals of themselves um being the hero that even when they're watching someone be heroic and failing failing at the level that Poe and Finn fail at to the point that they almost completely wiped out the resistance on behalf of saving the resistance. I don't think my husband or my son or my friend that reviewed this for Camels with Hammers even understood. But I almost guarantee that every one, woman watching that movie was like, could they just get the men out of these movies so that we could solve these problems? <laughs> right? Because even in their hero status, failing miserably at a level of magnitude that is really hard to comprehend, they're still not seen as failures. Like, let, let's let that sink in. They fail so badly, they almost wipe out the entire resistance. And they're still seen from the audience standpoint as heroes because the stereotype hero is a guy who flaunts convention who resists the establishment and does his own thing despite everyone telling him not to and they do that and they fail and they're still considered heroes we need to have a conversation about that when we talk about how we move forward with movies that are truly equal because i don't like my male heroes to fail that miserably i was really kind of offended on behalf of men for how stupid these men were portrayed how stupid these char these male characters are every one of them whether we're talking about poe or finn or or ren or luke <laughs> all four of them are stupid idiots in this movie and yet luke's the hero still he still inspires hope and poe's the rogue hero that everyone likes and Finn is the Han Solo character who's coming around and you know Ren is clearly our evil guy who will eventually be redeemed by maybe Ray I don't know Ray seems to be the only one with balance Leia had balance the other general that Laura Dern played had balance the only guy that seemed to have balance in this movie was the thief all the other males were so consumed with their egos that they couldn't see the forest through the trees. Um, all right, so let's, now that we're on this, let's talk about the casino part of this because 
there's another besides the light and the dark and the balance and the feminism and the portrayal of men and women in movies in general and in this movie in particular we also have um the war profiteers these the people at the casino according to rose are all war profiteers they're the richest people in the galaxy because they they get rich off of the fight they get rich when there's a rebellion and there's a resistance and they get rich off of the wars they profit either way we have that problem you know in america we were warned of the the military industrial congressional complex because people get rich off of war and these wars are often unnecessary as our thief below points out um today they're blowing you up tomorrow you're going to blow them up in the grand scheme of things who cares and in most cases when we're talking about violence and war that's how i feel like what's the point of all of this you're going to blow them up they're going to blow you up in the meantime the rest of us trying to get on with our lives are being hurt by this because these people are hoarding wealth and getting rich off the rest of us dying and that's something i think the whole world the humans of the world need to start grappling with when our leaders start trying to convince us and i'm not saying we shouldn't resist evil right we absolutely should but what form does that resistance take and how do we go about doing that and i think that's one of the subplots of this movie is these people are evil they're the oligarchs of the world and they get rich when the rest of us are fighting each other and don't fight back against their control and the fight back against their control doesn't necessarily require violence. We can make changes in countless nonviolent ways to sap them of their strength and the power. And the first part of that is an individual choice to not get swept up in the duality that we're good and they're evil, whatever that is. And we find that happening a lot in every culture, everywhere. We're good, they're evil. This is tribal thinking. We all fall prey to tribal thinking. So um, that was one of the things I thought, you know, was deserving of reflection and conversation. Um, and the thief's view of the futility of it all. I don't think resistance is futile, but I think we have to be strategic about our resistance so that we don't waste our resources, time, energy, and money doing things that serve no point and actually hurt our cause, a la... Poe and Finn. <laughs> oh my gosh. Poe and Finn, seriously. We need to be strategic about this. And that brings us back to how we think about what, it, what being a hero really is. Is it the cool calmness of the Leia and the um, Laura Dern's general character? Or is it the flamboyant, um, the flamboyance of the Poes and the Finns and the Rands, Kylo Ren or Luke, right? I'd like to see that sort of change in the movies. Um, hope. Oh, uh, nope. Nope. Right. Okay, here we go. Sorry. Had to find the right slide. Um, the reason Ray is reaching out to Luke is because they need a symbol of hope. And they're thinking at the, her thinking at the time is that we need a Jedi to be that symbol of hope. But actually it's Rose's character um, who kind of explains this the best. When Finn and Rose are on the casino planet, um, she's kind of explaining to him what, she has a ring she has a ring that um, that has the resistance symbol on it that she can open up and show the resistance symbol. And she says this, the fact that a resistance exists is what gives people hope. And the very end, last scene of the movie involves one of the boys who caretakes for those creatures um, that the, the horseback riding racing creatures um, you know he's a force wielder and he's got the ring now and it's it's a symbol of hope for him that the existence of a resistance is enough to create to create hope um that we don't need the individuals and um and that kind of comes back to ray's 
origin stories. And this is a spoiler. It turns out Ray's origin is not special. Her parents were alcoholics and they sold her off to slavery to pay, pay for alcohol and whatever they were doing. That's it. And it's similar to Anakin's origin story. It's similar to the boy in the stables uh, origin stories that, that you don't have to be a special person. You don't have to be a famous lineage like Ray is in order to make a difference in the galaxy and in, in your life and in the lives of others. Anybody can, by choosing to, um, to rise above and not allow evil to persist can make a difference. And I, I, this is my favorite part of the movie was finding out who Ray is. You know, I was speculating, okay, you know, I've read the books and I understand the books are mythology, but Han and Leia had two kids. One was Jason and one, they had several kids, but there were twins, right? Jason and Jaina. And, um, they come to a head with Jason going to the dark side and Jaina having to kill her brother. And I was thinking that this might echo that storyline, but it turns out that she, she's no one special. She is no one special. She just happens to have force abilities. She's not going to become a Jedi because like, not just because you have force abilities doesn't mean you have to choose the Sith religion or the Jedi religion. You can be neither. And that's clearly the path that Leia chose. And that's the path that Rey is choosing because Luke refused to allow her to be a Jedi. <laughs> it is, it, he was smart to do that too. But you don't have to choose to be either. You, know, you can choose to be neither and to just get on with life as best you can. And that's the choice that Rey is making. And to me, it's, it's the most powerful choice you can have. This individual who's nothing special, who's rejecting both the quote-unquote light path and the dark path instead choosing to live in balance how great is that i think that i think that's fabulous so um was the movie good yeah i'm planning to see it again was there a lot to think about oh yeah there's a lot in there i'm looking forward to seeing it again um i'm hoping the next movie the boys aren't so stupid um, and I'm looking forward to seeing how they create the balance. I'm hoping they finally give us balance between lark, light and dark. Not that that ever goes away, but I think, I think there's always going to be people that prefer authoritarianism. Um, Ray gets, Ren gets at that a little bit when, um, he's trying to talk Ray into joining him. He's like, the light and dark, you have to let that go. The idea of light and dark, you have to let go entirely. And he's right about that, but he's also chosen dark. <laughs> and this is the thing that's so frustrating is Luke says the same thing. You have to let go of that and yet be afraid of the dark. And Ren says you have to let go of that, but join me in the dark. And Ray's like to both of them going, no, neither of you is right. Sorry. <laughs> And so to me, that's why I think she's the lead character is because she's got, on one hand, she's got Luke saying, avoid the dark, be light and avoid the dark. And she's got Ren saying, ignore the light, come to the dark. And she's going, both of y'all stupid. You don't have to choose a religion. You don't have to choose a theology. You can choose to live independently and do the best you can to be a good person and sometimes, and that means not being afraid of the dark inside of yourself because anger is a tool, an emotional tool. I write about this in my book, The Humanist Approach to Happiness. It's a tool. You don't have to be afraid of your anger. You don't make decisions while angry, but anger and fear is telling you something is wrong. They're in your emotional toolkit for a reason. They're telling you something is wrong and needs to be fixed. So go ahead and fix it. Don't just don't fix it in in a dark when you're feeling one of the dark emotions and don't wallow in the dark and don't be but don't be afraid of the dark either i think that's the lesson so good movie um i hope you enjoyed it as much as me i'll be curious to see what y'all think <laughs>